Ah yes, Metal Gear. Once Konami's flagship franchise, standing with the absolute greats like Castlevania, Contra and Silent Hill, it has since been reduced to a shadow of its former self, with the series now being handed off to third-party developers to create stuff like Metal Gear Survive or, I don't know, patchy slot machines, I guess. For those unaware, that's a portmanteau of pachinko and slot machines. Yes, we truly live in the darkest of timelines. But that's not what we're here for today. No, today we're here for the weird, the forgotten, the Metal Gear games you never even knew existed. No, we're not doing Metal Gear Heart of the Cards Acid or Metal Gear Digital Graphical Novel. Those are fairly well known. Think deeper. Think more obscure and think weirder. <laughs> so come on with me and let's see how far this rabbit hole goes. If you're a Metal Gear fan, chances are that you've at least heard of the game where the series began, Metal Gear for the MSX. And there's a good chance you might have even played this version, or the NES port, which received the Western launch back in the day. But did you know that Metal Gear was also brought over to the Commodore 64? Yes, that's right! and it was brought to us by none other than Unlimited Software Inc., the same studio responsible for… the MS-DOS port of Castlevania. So you know you're in good hands here. Yes, Kojima's classic game got a port to the humble Commodore 64 back in the day, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not great. Well, I say back in the day, but this port actually launched in 1989 in the US and 1990 in Europe. For context, that's 2-3 to three years after the NES port and a full year after the Sega Genesis launched in the US. So saying that this version was outdated the very day it came out would be a bit of an understatement. Additionally, this port is actually based on the NES and not the MSX original. How do I know that? Well, for one thing, it starts you off in a jungle portion, which was actually an area that was originally created exclusively for the NES. It even has the same airplane cutscene as the NES, except here you're the only one parachuting, whereas on the NES there were two more unnamed characters parachuting with you. The game also got a very ill-fitting title theme song. I don't know, to me, it just sounds like it belongs on a skateboarding game. But the rest of the soundtrack is here, and it's mostly intact. Some songs sound a little off-key at times, but nothing too serious. But in the end, this version is… I mean, it's not awful or anything. Sure, it runs a little slow and a little janky, and the graphics were clearly downgraded from either the MSX or the NES, but at its core, this is still a playable version of Metal Gear. I would say that this is a couple of notches below the NES port, and the NES version was already a few notches below the MSX original. But at the end of the day, if you really wanted to play Metal Gear back then and you did not live in Japan or own an NES, you could do worse than Metal Gear for the Commodore 64. It's not good, it's not bad, it's somewhere down the middle. It's acceptable. And that's more than I can say for our next game. Yes, 
yes, we're not done with the original Metal Gear. That's right, there was yet another port of this game, this time for the MS-DOS. Launched a few months after the Commodore 64 port, meaning that yes, this version was even more outdated upon launch, Metal Gear would be brought over to IBM PCs by a single person it seems. Yeah, not even a studio, just one guy. Damn dude, that sucks. Anyway, this version is also based on the NES port, as it once again starts you off in a jungle and once again you have the same airplane cutscene with only Snake jumping down. And uh, yeah, this version is worse than the Commodore 64 version. Man, it's like we just keep going down a totem pole of trash. But yeah, this version is horrible. For one thing, it either runs too slow or too fast. Basically, the game's speed is tied to your processor speed. Meaning that if you have your DOS box settings to a fast CPU, then certain parts of the game will run too fast. Meaning certain hazards will land multiple hits in a fraction of a second, killing you instantly. And you'll be unable to change floors on elevators because the buttons simply move too fast. But slow down your CPU speed and suddenly the game becomes painfully slow, moving at a snail's pace and its screen takes an eternity to load. And I just could not find a CPU speed that had this game running at a good balance. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Trust me, it gets way worse. For starters, enemies no longer call reinforcements. So this means that every time you're spotted, you only have to deal with enemies on screen, making the game much easier. Heck, you can actually just walk past them, because the alarm status will always reset once you change screens. So you really don't have to be stealthy at all, as you can just run past everyone. I mean, heck, look at this! Being spotted by the cameras does… nothing. Literally nothing. Sure, they're on alert status, but with no enemies being summoned, cameras are entirely pointless. Another funny thing is that expendable items like rations or bullets automatically reset every time you change screens. So you can just keep leaving and entering the same room over and over again to collect the maximum amount of rations, bullets or mines. And as if that weren't enough, enemies do not shoot bullets either. You are literally the only character in this game carrying a gun. And considering you basically have infinite bullets, there's literally zero reason to try and be stealthy in this game. I mean, this game is basically Contra at this point. But wait! There's more! You know that room with the rolling barrels that kill you instantly? Well, turns out that in some parts of the game, you can just walk towards the edge of the screen and come out the other side. Meaning that you can skip entire areas and rooms, including this one. But wait! There's more! Oh, but wait, we're still not done! Because it seems that the remote control missile logic is also connected to the CPU speed. Basically, if your CPU speed is too slow, you cannot blow up the fuse box, because your missile will always blow up ahead of time. Just God, this game just cannot get anything right! You either run too fast and die instantly, or run too slow and some parts just don't work as intended. But you know what, folks? You're not gonna believe this, but there's more. But wait! There's more! Because the game's music and sound effects sound like this. Yes, this is literally how the game sounds. Supposedly, the people who cracked this game back in the 90s included an installation file in which you could change sound cards, but the buttons that are supposed to allow you to do that simply don't work. So uh, I don't think this game is compatible with Adlib or Sound Blaster cards. And the funny thing is that this game breaks so many things and removes so many gameplay features, but somehow the devs, or dev I should say, somehow found the time to add cutscenes. Yes, that's right, you now have cutscenes that are exclusive to this version. Like for example, you now get this cutscene every time you exit an elevator. Riveting. Or how about this cutscene when you get captured? Man, that is just one for the good faces bot. And I just love that super secret agent Snake is now wearing a tag with his codename on it, like some kind of dork. And now I know what you're thinking. 
Stika, this game is just too fancy for me. Can we somehow make this even more janky? And you know what? I got you fam. Behold, Metal Gear running in CGI mode. Now this is the jankiness you were looking for. Man, this game, there's just no saving it. Avoid this one at all costs. Unless of course you want something to point at and laugh. And there's a lot to laugh at here. Tiger brings you Game Talk, talking games like Snake's Revenge. Lieutenant, let's put the plan into effect. Yes, sir! Yes, that's right! The much maligned Metal Gear Snake's Revenge for the NES got a port to a Tiger Electronics LCD handheld. It just could not get any better. Oh, but not just any Tiger LCD handheld. Oh no! One with voices! Behind the next door. Now, there are several ways to play Tiger Electronic games online, either through pickapick.com or archive.org, both of which feature a slew of handheld LCD games to play. But sadly, Snake's Revenge is not one of the games available, so all I can do is show you some YouTube footage of other people who do own it. And well, it's a Tiger Electronics game with voices. It's exactly what you'd expect it to be. There's not really much to say here. It seems that it's basically the Space Invaders formula, but with fewer enemies on screen. Occasionally a voice will pop up telling you if there's a pickup nearby, or if you just collected the pickup. And that's it really. Though to be fair, this does look like one of the better Tag Electronics games. But that doesn't mean much. In the end, it looks like something that could hold your attention for a few minutes, but nothing more. I'm sure you're all familiar with Metal Gear Solid on the Game Boy Color, which was a pretty faithful spin-off of the PS1 Metal Gear Solid game. But did you know there was another Metal Gear Solid game for the Game Boy Color? Metal Gear Solid 2, or rather Mattel Gear Solid 2, is a beat'em up for the Game Boy Color starring various characters from the PS1 game, including Solid Snake, Meryl, Grey Fox and Master Miller. Oh, also, this game's not actually official. Yes, this is a bootleg game made in Taiwan without Konami's or Kojima's consent. And also, there's a lot of weirdness in this game. Like how Meryl, or Melia I should say, is now a French ninja. Or how Firefox here looks like this. But the best one has got to be Master Miller. He doesn't even look like he belongs in this game. In this game, you're even given an incomprehensible mission briefing by Colonel Campbell and Mei Ling before being sent out to beat bad guys. Along the way, you'll find other characters who advance the plot, but good luck figuring out what the hell is going on here. But the most surprising thing about this game is that it's actually pretty damn good. Yeah, this is a surprisingly good beat-em-up for the Game Boy. For one thing, you have a level up system. The more enemies you defeat, the stronger you get and the more HP you earn. And you can even replay missions on the map to earn even more experience. Additionally, there's a variety of moves to learn. I mean, sure, you can just keep spamming the sentry hit combo if that's your thing, but you're gonna get pretty bored pretty quickly. Every character has an assortment of moves and it's up to you to learn them and chain them. But in essence, this game is all about the air juggles and chaining different combos to earn experience multipliers. Ironically, this game starts out super hard, but then gets easier as you progress. Basically, once your character levels up a bit, you kinda become unstoppable. If you want to learn more about this one, I did a full review on this last year, so check it out. But yeah, this weird Metal Gear Solid beat'em up is the first game on this list that is actually good, which is made all the funnier when you consider that this is not even an official title. Ouch Konami, ouch.
come on, you all knew it was only a matter of time until we talked about the weird phone games. And Metal Gear Solid Touch is most definitely a weird one. Launched in 2009, this is basically a retelling of Metal Gear Solid 4. And uh, yeah, it's just a very basic gallery shooter. All you have to do is just basically tap the screen on an enemy a few times and shoot them before they shoot you. Most don't even move, they're just completely mobile. Occasionally you'll have to use a sniper rifle or a rocket launcher, or you have to shoot a rubber ducky for bonuses, but that's pretty much it. At the end of each stage, you're given points that allow you to buy rewards like wallpapers for your phone, so that's nice, I guess. And I'm honestly struggling to find things to say about this one. This is just as basic as a game can get. I think I would actually prefer the Tiger Electronics game better. I have seven bullets. If anything, the most interesting thing about this game is that when Konami launched a teaser for it, several gaming publications thought that it meant Metal Gear Solid 4 was coming to the Xbox 360, which drove all the fanboys on both camps into a frenzy. And that's honestly the most interesting thing I can say about this game, which is pretty sad when you think about it. We now move from one mobile game to another, with Metal Gear Solid Mobile for the Nokia N-Gage. No, not that Nokia N-Gage, this Nokia N-Gage. This was for the N-Gage 2.0, which was Nokia's mobile gaming service, which lasted about a year before it died. Ironically, from what I understand, the N-Gage 2.0 actually had some pretty good games for the time, and this was one of them. Metal Gear Solid Mobile is basically Metal Gear Solid 2 on a Nokia phone running Metal Gear Solid 1 graphics. The story takes place between Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2, though as far as I'm aware, none of it is considered canon. But this is unequivocally Metal Gear Solid. In fact, it's probably the most faithful Metal Gear game in this entire video. Your controls, moveset, visuals and character models are all based around Metal Gear Solid 2, but the low resolution and polygon count makes the visuals seem closer to Metal Gear Solid 1. So it's kinda fitting that this game takes place between those two titles. There are no voiceovers during codec conversations and the music was downgraded to MIDI. But these are acceptable trade-offs for phone games of the time. And as far as I'm aware, the worst part about this game isn't even a fault with the game itself, but rather the fact that you have to play it on a Nokia phone, which also explains why the level design is a bit simplified. I mean, can you imagine playing a Metal Gear game on a Nokia keyboard or touchpad? We can only do so much on this thing. It was a valiant effort by Konami and I've seen some people malign this game, but personally, I think they're being rather harsh, considering the immense hardware and user interface limitations that this game was set against. So to me, it's a miracle that Metal Gear Mobile turned out as well as it did. And there you have it, 6 weird and forgotten Metal Gear games. Are there any games I've forgotten about? What titles would you like to have seen me mention? Let me know in the comments! And hey, if you want to know more about that Metal Gear bootleg beat-em-up, you can always check my full review on it. And stick around until the end of this video to watch the full commercial of the Metal Gear Snake's Revenge Tiger LCD game. But in the meantime, that's it for me today, folks. I want to give thanks to my new high-tier Patreon supporter, Apple, as well as my long-running high-tier Patreon supporters, Anthony Ryan Bennett, Genru and New K. Thank you for making this channel better. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye! Tiger brings you Game Talk, talking games like Snake's Revenge. Lieutenant, let's put the plan into effect. Yes, sir. Any mission check? I got two bullets. Are you okay? Yeah. I got key card number one. Watch out, Metal Gear ahead. Mission accomplished. Game Talk Snake's Revenge, the next generation from Tiger Electronics.